Welcome back, everyone. My name is Lida Modiano. I'm an advisor to Reload Greece on strategic partnerships. Thank you for staying with us in this last part of the conference. Uh, rest assured that there is more uh, valuable insight coming. <laughs> so you did well to stay. Uh, the topic of our next panel is cultural reform, the role of the diaspora. And most of us in this room uh, are part of this diaspora, so I guess it's a topic which is quite relevant to our life. And we are very interested to hear the views of the distinguished academics uh, on this panel coming from US, UK and Greece. Yorgos Milonavis, uh, adjunct professor of strategy and entrepreneurship at the London Business School and also a trustee at Reload Greece. And if I may add, a catalyst uh, for the creation of our organization and its development is going to moderate this discussion. So welcome on stage. Thank you, Lida. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to host this panel on uh, the role of the academic diaspora in affecting cultural change in Greece. Uh, I have a distinguished panel. I'd like to introduce my guests. Uh, we have uh, Othon Anastasakis, who is the director of the Center for Southeastern European Studies at the Oxford University, CSOX. He's also teaching there Southeastern European politics and EU politics. Andonis Kamaras, who is an experienced policy analyst and advisor and an affiliate of CSOX. On this side, uh, Kostas Megir, a professor of economics at uh, Yale University, and uh, Nikos Vetas, who is the general director of the Foundation for Economic and Industrial Research, IOVE, in Athens, and also a professor at the Athens University of Economic and Business. Uh, my colleagues have uh, developed two very interesting projects, uh, one uh, by Kamaras and Anastasakis on the Greek uh, diaspora, and uh, the other uh, by uh, Megir uh, Vetas, Dimitri Vagianos, who is an advisor to the conference, and Christopher Pisaridis, uh, which is the edited, uh, recently published edited volume, uh, Beyond Austerity, uh, Reforming the Greek Economy. While we will not have time to go into great detail in uh, either of those two projects, we will get a chance to hear about them. But uh, perhaps this panel discussion will whet your appetite to want to learn more about them, and uh, perhaps even find out how to get involved. Uh, we have one more objective on this panel. Um, both of these projects are very good demonstrations of what Effie said uh, in the morning, which is that uh, entrepreneurship requires taking initiative, forging relationships uh, in ways that have not been done before, and uh, developing a, a new course of action. And I, that statement that Effie made spoke to my heart, uh, because as Lida mentioned, when I met uh, the co-founders of Reload Greece in 2012, five years ago, I could have never imagined the kind of commitment I would end up making on the Reload Greece project. Uh, that commitment required, uh, that process required uh, taking a leap of uh, faith into the unknown. Um, it required uh, learning quite a lot, making great new friends, and uh, perhaps accomplishment, it might be str too strong a word, but certainly being able to sleep better to every night knowing that you've done your bit. Uh, and I think I'm speaking for all my colleagues here on the panel saying that uh, I think our ambition is that once you hear the Costas that uh, the stories that uh, Costas, uh, Nikos, uh, Andonis and uh, Othon have to share with us, uh, perhaps you might start asking yourselves if uh, these academics can be entrepreneurs, why can't I be an entrepreneur as well? Uh, so we'll start with a discussion amongst so the panel. <laughs> start with the discussion of the panel and then open it up, open it up for questions. So let me turn to Othon first. Uh, the Greek diaspora project and uh, the work that you do at CISOX Othon. Can you give us a sense of what this is about? Yes. Before that, I want to uh, thank Effie um, and Christina and the whole team. And Yorgos, of course, who's a very, very close friend. We've known each other since the university years in Athens. Uh, and I've been following that um, tremendous um, uh, initiative that you have uh, started here. Um, and uh, believe me, we can be entrepreneurs because 80% of my time in Oxford is actually about administration and running <laughs> projects. And in that sense, this one is not only a research project, the uh, Greek Diaspora Project, GDP. Um, 
it's also an action project. And that's very important because that is specific identity within the university that we are operating. So we've got this academic context in Oxford, and especially at St. Anthony's College, which is one of the 39 colleges, that has that special kind of relationship and it does stimulate it between academics and policy makers. So we already are grounded within the policy making community. Now, the Greek diaspora project is our flagship project at uh, CSOX, at Southeast European Studies at Oxford. And I speak here on behalf of my colleagues as well, Manolis Patsinakis who's here, and Kira Gantsu, and Fotini who's there at the slides at the, behind the screen. And we all work together as a core team, together with others and affiliates in Oxford. Now, what is the big idea? How Greek diasporas engage in times of crisis with homeland, but also beyond crisis as well. So the dependent variable of this is the nature, the identity, and the significance <coughs> of Greek diaspora, or other diasporas, because we're talking about many localities, many different diasporas around the world. The mission to create something relevant and assist Greece at present struggling, obviously, with crisis through our analysis and study and how um, diaspora can be a part of this um, uh, procedure. The point of departure, the existence of a big number of uh, Greeks abroad through the previous waves, but also the very big uh, brain drain that has been taking place as a result of the crisis. Some have numbered this uh, in half a million. The methodology, we are conceptual, but also comparative and analytical in using primary and secondary material, and then also policy relevant with recommendations. The immediate aims that we've got for this year, the study of Greeks in the UK, and the big conference in June, uh, which we will invite uh, scholars from around the world to present <coughs> their work. The medium term is a series of milestones and deliverables to deepen our analysis and have an impact in the debate that is happening. And then the long-term vision is to make this also regional. And then you, you, we use pilot, uh, Greece as a pilot project, and then we can uh, um, uh, engage with other um, studies as well in other countries in Southeast Europe that also depend a lot on their diaspora's communities. Now, the, one of the originalities of this project is the interactive map that um, uh, I will show you uh, in the slide. Now, this is one of the, uh, the projects that is very, very um, important and, and originally that uh, we have created, and this is the first step, and we are very happy to present this. We have created this map, uh, which is about, uh, it's got various functions. The first one is mapping diaspora. So what we did is actually, you see all these balloons, and these balloons represent uh, data that we got through the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for the moment, and uh, we're also working on our side as well in collecting even more uh, uh, data. Um, and it's about mapping where the different organizations and federations are. So this balloon is actually, when you click the balloon, it explodes, and then you've got, um, if you go to the United States, which is the kind of the, the biggest one, the most impressive one, you see all these federations and organizations that are there that have a certain, um, uh, you know, of a certain nature in that they can be, uh, you know, in terms of the activity that we've got there, but also in terms of origin, where do the diaspora Greeks originate from? Um, and um, while uh, Fotini is showing some of the balloons, the second function of the map is the social platform. So our second stage is to make this interactive and create, we're already creating with a company which is uh, helping us, um, we are creating a special program that will be able to communicate with all these different organizations and federations and be able to communicate with them so that they can also put some information there, verify their data as well, and then, you know, hopefully have their stories uh, and more information that concerns them. The third one is an analytical toolkit. Obviously, you've all this data, you can have a very good um, you know, information about what's happening. And indeed, we've written our first blog about some of the quantitative um, data that we've got in there. You can see it in our CSOX website. And finally, it can be as a library to facilitate knowledge, transfer of events, conferences. I, I will stop uh, with that because I don't want to give Jorgos a heart attack. He's got <laughs> half an hour, he said. Uh, but then we can come back later with uh, more questions. Thank you, Othan, very much. Uh, well, carrying on, actually, on, on this project, uh, Adoni, can you give us a sense of the background here and how did it come into being? The, uh, the original idea, I was a trustee at Anatolia College, uh, which is uh, a private school in uh, Thessaloniki, uh, founded by American missionaries in the 19th century. And I was wondering why the Greek Americans were not giving enough to us. That was before the crisis. 
And you know, if you start asking that kind of question, then you wonder about how the diaspora feels about Greece, what are its modes of interaction, how that interaction can improve. Obviously, after the crisis, uh, this kind of questioning acquired a resonance uh, that was quite compelling for me. Uh, I came up with a paper when I was working with the municipality of Thessaloniki. We discussed it with Othon, and then the, the ball started rolling. Very good. And did you find it uh, uh, convenient, easy, useful to work with a university that's outside of Greece as opposed yeah. to one in Greece? Uh, my study is that of an independent uh, research. I come from the financial sector, but I was always interested in, in scholarship and, and research. Uh, and as such, although I have many, many good friends in Greek academia, uh, for the institutions, for the universities themselves, I do not exist. And not because of a fault of mine, but it's because in the institutions it's very difficult to deal with someone who is not a typical uh, scholar who is not actually employed by them. And, and the crisis have made things worse because uh, the way uh, the Troika mandates have been interpreted is that the system has become even more centralized in order to control costs and to consolidate fiscally the Greek state. Uh, so the system has become even more rigid. So the, the idea didn't even cross my mind, I must say, to try to partner with, with the Greek university, you know, because there aren't excellent people there, there are actually, but because I knew that I could, I could find the kind of flexibility that was necessary for the project and for me to have a role in the project only outside Greece. Mm -hmm. I had that relationship with Othon, we had worked before at the London School of Economics, who had worked when I was a trustee at Anatolia College, so that's the way things uh, developed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's another relationship here, which is between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that Othon mentioned yeah. is giving yeah. you the data. That's true. It's kind of a public-private partnership of sorts. That's true. What is the benefit to the, the ministry from this I think the benefit, uh, again, you look at the, the Greek state in times of crisis, uh, there, are, there is only money for operational expenses. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, particularly in this juncture, for uh, any government agency to locate funding uh, for uh, strategizing analysis and so on and so forth. So what I believe will provide to the ministry will provide, if you will, R&D flexibility, right? We, we can uh, commit resources uh, to uh, something which can be of potential value, not only to the ministry, by the way, but also to everyone who's interested in the interaction between diaspora and Greece, that the ministry possibly would find very hard to uh, develop on its own because of the crisis juncture we we'll find ourselves in. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's turn over to you guys. Uh, Kostas, would you like to give us a sense of what uh, the, the famous yeah. book is about? <laughs> yes, well, um, actually, uh, in, at, the, at the heat of the crisis, uh, uh, a group of us started talking about the problems in, in Greece uh, on kind of uh, two fronts. First of all, uh, you know, what's kind of gone wrong? Why, 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 why is this crisis? Uh, is it really an issue of debt? Uh, is, is it something much more fundamental? But also, we were concerned about the way that issues are being approached uh, in Greece. So, for example, uh, we, what's the evidence base? How is policy designed? Uh, we actually have some, uh, some slides uh, oh, yeah, there. I can't see them there, that's why I got confused. So, um, uh, so, so basically, we started discussing, we started uh, publishing uh, articles as a, as a small group, uh, particularly uh, Dimitris uh, Vajanos, uh, Nikos Vedas and I, uh, and then we uh, designed this kind of conference where we brought together uh, a, a large number of uh, basically Greek descent academics or Greek academics living abroad. And at that conference, we uh, allocated uh, uh, chapters uh, and sectors of the Greek economy, things like uh, the public sector, the tax system, the labor markets, the product markets, and so on, to, to groups of people who specialize in this. They're all in, most of them are in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, well-known universities. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we asked them to do two things. First of all, to diagnose how that part of the economy uh, uh, contributed to the, to the onset of the crisis, and secondly, to, to propose reforms. One thing that's kind of important, and it's never been stressed, there's no party line here. Every group had their own views, they developed their own, uh, uh, the, the, their own uh, uh, line of attack on the problem. Of course, you know, we are, kind of relatively like-minded people, particularly on the methodological side. Uh, and, uh, but one thing that was really important for us is to, uh, is to bring in the concept of evidence-based policy. 
So everything that was being said in that, uh, in that book is supposed to be supported by real data and by, uh, and by, uh, and by uh, uh, cutting edge research, kind of bringing in what we know from uh, basic research in economics and the social sciences to bring it, bring it to bear with, um, uh, for, for, for dealing with Greek problems. This is the, as you can see, it's a, it's a large group of people. Uh, they, they range uh, in, uh, 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 from tons of institutions, you know, from, uh, from say, MIT or uh, Zurich or, uh, or Frankfurt or uh, London or whatever, you know, many, many, the US, et cetera, uh, a, a number of places, uh, various different views. No, it's not homogeneous, but there's one thing that permeates it, a rigor and evidence base. Thank you, Costa. If I may turn over to you, Nico. Uh, you are someone who's uh, lived abroad quite a lot, studied, worked abroad, came back to Greece. How do you, when you look at this kind of collaboration, what would you find interesting or unusual or, or useful in this kind of collaboration? One that cuts across both the international dimension, so people outside of Greece with people in Greece on the one hand, and also people who are more perhaps on the practitioner side and people who are on the academic side. Right, so th there is a particular way to look at the pathogenies of the Greek economy before the crisis and also what happened during the crisis, which is perhaps interesting. Uh, the Greek economy has increasingly become, actually I should say the Greek society, as, um, an entity that is afraid of change and afraid of foreigners. We are becoming closer and we are becoming more conservative. And in fact, opening up to new ideas, to new people, uh, to new capital, is essential if we, if we want to move from where we are to where perhaps we can be a little bit better. If we do not open up, the current status quo is actually the best we can achieve. And this is an example where you can open up to ideas. You do have an expertise. We, Greece is actually um, lucky to have an amazing in quality and quantity <coughs> diaspora. And if we do not open up now, when are we going to open up? Now, this book took a long time to write. Uh, it's actually a little bit more than uh, four years, I think. And it would have never been finished if it were not for Dimitri sending about 15 emails every day. Um, now, when we started it, we wanted to be a little bit more ephemeral, so how we can actually do things now. But then we, as we were digging, we found out that the problems were actually much deeper. So this has recommendations for what could happen actually tomorrow morning, but it actually puts the Greek economy in perspective. Back in the early 80s, Greece was among the most prosperous economies in Europe. We were ranked 14th within all the European economies. Today we are about 25. And this is not because of the crisis. This is a gradual slide. Um, there, there, is, there was kind of an internal joke, which was, you know, aren't you in a hurry to, to finish the book? I mean, the crisis is going to be over, and we are saying, no, it's not going to be over. Um, now, in, seriously, um, what this indicates is that whereas, as Costas also said, we do not necessarily agree on every single thing. If you actually take the experience that two things can bring into the Greek discussion, which is best practices from other countries, and at the same time, evidence-based analysis. 95% of economists would more or less agree on what should happen in Greece in some key areas. And when I'm saying key areas, economics is not just some sort of macro identities. Economics has to do with the education system, the justice system, um, healthcare, so that's why the book takes a more view that focuses on institutions rather than the arithmetic of things. Uh, and in that sense, whereas it is rigorous, it is written in a way that the average citizen could and should actually approach. One last thought, because I'm watching your device there. <laughs> he, he, he's pointing this to me. He has it like that. <laughs> Th this thing about not being open, perhaps it, 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 it is uh, a natural tendency when, when you are in trouble to go to your comfort zone. To, 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 to. And maybe this is becoming even in, in stronger economies than ours. Okay? If you think perhaps of, of, of the Americans or should I say the UK? 
um, <laughs> that when you don't have an easy way to grow, as perhaps you had 20 years ago, now you're starting pointing the finger to foreigners. You don't want them into the country. You don't want the foreign ideas. You don't want monitoring. However, even if for large economies I could understand this, for a small economy like Greece, there, there is no excuse. And the only way for, for, for us is I'm not going to repeat the standard cliche that we have to become like Denmark or, or Israel or, or, or the Dutch, uh, but basically we have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think what you have, all, all four of you said, gives us a very good sense of what your projects are about. But before we open it up to the audience, I wanted to get one more kind of thought from uh, all of you, which is about the ultimate objective here. So in a way, you're at the start of the process. You have, in, in a way, finished the process, perhaps not finished it. But uh, can you give us a sense of what you're aiming to accomplish here? So what would be, what would be a great measure of success? And what is the time frame that you have in mind? Can I just say something before the, um, uh, the aims and objectives, just to say a little bit about the substance. Because we look at the diaspora, not in a kind of an idealistic way, in a normative way, what it should be, but also in the real way. So we know that there are limits and that you know, others can contribute and others can be negative. So we are kind of very, very open in what we're seeing with, you know, in terms of how diaspora engages. But what we would like to achieve with this is have, first of all, an impact with um, engaging with young scholars from here and from Greece. Mm -hmm. And that's very much you know, uh, part of our, um, uh, of our um, uh, job. We also want to, you know, obviously, to have um, a number of, of publications and, and an output that would be really, the, you know, that, that can make a difference. Um, and um, we also want to expand networking. And so connectivity is a very, very important um, uh, part of our work. And because this is a global outreach, that, I think, is a fascination also for all those who want to come and work for this project because it's kind of, it deals with the whole world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the map gives an idea as to how we can connect and how can, we can do uh, joint projects, not that just between us and studying ourselves and, and Greece, but also between uh, diasporas uh, themselves. Um, and um, in, in that sense, we really would like to make a difference with the substance of things that we will be talking about. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like a normative objective, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of us, yes. normative, yeah. but not in terms of how we see diaspora dealing with Greece. Right. So don't you want to add? Uh, yeah. I, I, well, ultimately, I don't think of the diaspora, but I think of Hellenism. I think we, we should be in the business of, of redefining Hellenism as a, a cross-border community which has uh, a highly developed uh, a sense of a joint uh, fate. Yeah. That's, that's how we see the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in terms of time frame, when do you expect to see anything that you would recognize as, as an impact of what you have done? A year, six years, 10 years? The impact, you see it um, you know, in, in your work. In academic time yeah, frames. You yeah. see it in, in, you know, in your work as it proceeds. So for instance, you know, when you see your journals to go into academic journals and having gone through this peer reviewed process, you already have an impact there. When you see your, you know, your um, uh, information and your output in, in a newspaper, all being helpful to state officials, that's something also that uh, you know that uh, that uh, makes a difference, and and, and um, it's actually some kind of an impact. So this is a, a three to five year old uh, uh, you know project. It, it starts now, so it's kind of gradual. When we do the conference, for instance, and uh, uh, we're going to have all um, uh, those who will talk about that as well present their papers. There's going to be a book, and that's going to be a significant um, output as well. So you see the impact, and, and that, I think, is a, the, the pleasure of this whole thing, is that you see impact in all these little things that you are, uh, that, you know, the sky is the limit, basically, with these kinds of projects. Thank you. Over to you guys. You've just finished, so you're done. Now you're ready to go on vacation for? I'm certainly ready to go on vacation, uh, <laughs> but we can't. Uh, because as you probably imply, the, yes, the job's I not do. done. Uh, the, the ultimate objective, of course, is to have everything we say in the book implemented. Uh, but that's not going to happen. But at least what we'd like to do is see the way that the debate takes place in Greece to change, right? A again, to move away from purely ideological cliché and kind of be able to, to discuss about policy in a, in, a, in a sensible, positive way that's evidence-based on which at least we can start arguing rather than kind of labeling uh, uh, people with political labels uh, of, of one type or, or the other. Even if we manage to change the way that the debate takes place uh, in Greece, that will be a huge achievement. If we start seeing 
some of the ideas that we've been uh, mentioning to uh, being debated, that would be even even uh, even greater uh, achievement. We actually have seen some of the things that we've uh, suggested in in op-ed uh, actually maturing, like uh, you know debt for reform type uh, type policies. We've seen them now uh, being uh, being discussed more and more. If we could see more of the ideas that we've now put in the books as uh, 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 on the agenda, uh, that would be fantastic. But if at least we can see a rational debate, evidence-based debate in, in policy, that would be a, a, huge, a huge step. Nico. Right, so, so I'm, I'm not going to tell you something that people don't know, but the situation in Greece is actually extremely difficult. Even if you actually see some marginal improvement in this or that, lots of people are running out of their lifetime savings and everybody is basically running out of energy and patience. So marginal improvements will not do. And if the core scenario is that we are going to move parallelly like that for the next 10 or 15 years, that is not good enough. So there must be a sense of energy. We share this sense of energy. Naturally, the decisions are taken by politicians as, as they should. And academics cannot tell politicians what to do. All, only the, the voters, the citizens, can tell politicians what to do. But our part of the job is actually to clean up the evidence and to those who are actually willing to listen, to give them the opportunity to say, I have a choice. Now, if the choice at the level of the government or the level of the society is to go this way or that way, that's fine. But at the very least, you can help people make an informed choice. This is becoming increasingly difficult because, as I said, after about 10 years of a mess, um, people do not have the appetite at this point for an in-depth discussion. This is unfortunate. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to open it up uh, for questions from the floor. The back. With us, uh, I'm referring to your book uh, for the austerity. I mean, are there uh, any low-hanging fruits, for example? Is there anything that uh, you concluded that it's easy to do? So, thank you. Uh, let's take two more questions and then bring it back over there. Thank you. Um, to the uh, left of the panel, the question is really similar to the previous one, but with a, with a little twist. Um, are there any um, key takeaways from uh, the evidence that you have gathered in the book um, that you would like to share that are not in the public discourse, uh, evidence-based? And to the right, as I look at the panel, uh, Antonis, you mentioned that the um, the initiative to start to embark on this uh, uh, journey to start mapping the uh, diaspora was um, a problem that you faced with uh, finding um, funding from abroad coming into Greece. Have you found a solution or maybe you have described some norms in that, um, in that venture? Thank you. Have you found a solution there? Thank you. Um, I think this makes for three questions, so maybe Start with the last one, Adoni. Uh, no, I, what I can say is that uh, starting out with a project, it has given me the opportunity to think in a very structured way. Why do we have faced the problems that we did at the Board of Trustees of, of Anatolia College? And I, I'm, I'm very excited with the idea that I'll be able to, uh, or, or we will be able, this is a team effort, to offer a proper diagnosis and then promote the debate and suggest the policy tools that would allow an institution like Anatolia, whether a state or a private one, to establish a more effective relationship with the diaspora, whether it's in the United States or in Canada or in Australia or, sorry, in, Australia or in Germany or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Anything we don't know that uh, you're, you're willing not to make public, but you're willing to tell us? I'm not sure what that would be. <laughs> well, we have a, a secret recipe, but we will <laughs> share <laughs> You want to start? Well, yeah, I mean, low-hanging fruit, there are many low-hanging fruit. Uh, the problem is that they are interconnected. So for example, uh, the obvious thing that in, we, we all know here, we need to uh, encourage entrepreneurship, right? You know, that's, you know, if, if we don't have 
uh, outward, uh, outward looking uh, uh, companies that are you know, willing to operate in Greece and are willing to export, then uh, we are condemned to a, a continuous um, uh, compression of standards of living and uh, the mechanisms are obvious. But if I may add, you don't have a chapter on entrepreneurship in the book, is that right? Well, we do. Mm -hmm. The point is that entrepreneurship is encouraged not, not just by <coughs> talking <coughs> about entrepreneurship, but by having institutions that do not impede entrepreneurship. Right? So that's, uh, that, that's, of course, key. So you need competition in the, in the product markets. You need a judicial system that actually operates and allows you to be able to enforce contracts. Uh, as one of the chapters uh, in the, uh, by, by Elias Fabaiwanu uh, uh, mentions, there are 280,000 uh, uh, court cases pending in Greece at the moment. So, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to start a business and you want to write a complicated contract, you have to know that this contract can be enforced. Without your judiciary, it cannot be enforced. Then if you have a, a labor market that is dysfunctional, it's very hard to, uh, to, to, to plan a business. So the low hanging there are many low hanging fruit in the sense that there are tons of things that can be done and will yield very quickly uh, a return, but they have to be done as a group. There's no point in improving the education system and then producing graduates that can't find any jobs because the, the whole uh, labor market is totally, uh, uh, totally frozen. So, uh, and we've got this question in Greece. You know, the, what I would do uh, in the first 100 days, well, the first thing, of course, you, 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 you need to announce that you are open for business. You need to create a commission of business people that will help you identify the, the key priority regulations uh, to, uh, uh, to address. Uh, and you need to start uh, reforming the tax system, which is completely punitive at the moment, the, 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 the costs of uh, of hiring uh, people is, um, uh, is, is prohibitive. Uh, so, you know, there are, uh, so there's, unfortunately, the point about Greece is that we've come down this road for the last 30 or so years, such that it's not a simple, I'll do this and everything will be fine. It's a complex set of interrelated policies that have to be implemented, but they have very high return and very quick return, and many of them are free to implement. Can I add? Three very quick things. I see something that says one minute, so this is how many seconds per... Uh, all right. First of all, we, we, we first published the book in English uh, because we are not only addressing those who live in Greece. During this crisis, we actually saw two sort of misunderstandings coming from people abroad, especially from people in the US, I would say. Uh, one possible misreading of the Greek crisis is that the crisis came because of the euro, and unless you leave the eurozone, the crisis will not be over. And there is a lot of analysis in the book that actually shows that the crisis is not because of the euro, the crisis is because of institutions, and if you actually leave the euro, institutions will probably deteriorate. Likewise, there are lots of people who think that Greece is unreformable, and unless you press a red button and you start from zero, nothing can be done. And we do not believe this either. Then there is the issue that Costas actually mentioned. In all of these low-hanging three areas, you, you should actually quantify. And the benefits that you're going to have if you become a, quote, normal country are actually massive. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to repeat the, this thing that I said. It's a decision where you're going to go. It is not that. Um, you don't know where you could go. Final thing, Yoro. If there is one thing that connects everything, is that um, in, at least in the last 30, 40 years, I guess at least, economics has developed into the field that is the systematic study of incentives. Incentives at every level. Incentives for businesses, incentives for workers, incentives for politicians. And we have fixed a lot of things during the crisis. And actually, it is close to a miracle that the two deficits have been fixed. However, the incentives have gone the wrong way. An example is the pension system, where basically we have equalized the plus and the minus. However, there is no incentive for you not to actually be dishonest with the state. So we're bringing the fact that incentives have, have to be aligned if you want the exit from the crisis to be sustainable. Thank you very much. I think 
it, it, what becomes obvious to me hearing uh, all of you talk is on your side, you, you've done an enormous amount of work in, in this book. It's a pro product of many years of, of work and lots of people contributing. You have serviced many of the problems that are endemic in the economy and you are suggesting ways of dealing with them. So obviously, we're making a great disservice if we're trying to condense the essence of what you have found out in just a few minutes. And I would encourage everyone to read the book and, as you say, have a conversation around the issues that are being raised there. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work that uh, remains to be done in terms of dissemination of the, of, of the findings, as we're talking with uh, Dimitri earlier in the day. And on your side, I think it's a fantastic project, the one that you started, it gives a lot of opportunity for starting to have the conversation from the very beginning about how, how these communities are uh, constituted, who belongs to them, what is the work that they do, how do they give back or connect to Greece. So I, 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 what I really like about what you are doing is the fact that from the get-go you are opening it up as a project that has some degree of interactivity with the people who are uh, comprising those communities. So obviously a lot uh, to be learned from talking to uh, all, all of my colleagues here on the panel. Uh, again, I hope this has been inspiring in the thinking, making you think, you know, if academics can be entrepreneurs, uh, why can't I be? Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for your time. Thank you.